In Genesis chapters 17, 18, and 21, we read several times about laughter. There are different kinds of laughter, of course. We laugh when something is funny, we laugh when we're tickled. Uh, there's also nervous laughter, cruel laughter. There's courtesy laughter when something really isn't that funny, but you laugh anyway to make the person feel good about themselves. Uh, in the story of Abraham and Sarah, there are two other kinds of laughter. There's the laughter of doubt and the laughter of amazement. Has something happened that's so amazing, so incredible that you just had to laugh about it? Well, that's the kind of laughter that we see when we get to chapter 21. We won't get all the way there this morning, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how the story turns out at least, which begins... Well, really at chapter 12, but especially here in chapter 17. When God promises Abraham and Sarah that they will have a son, they both laugh. Abraham is an old man. Sarah has been barren her whole life. And so their laughter is a laughter of doubt. Can this really happen? Can God really do this for us? But eventually, at the end of the story, their laughter of doubt turns into laughter of amazement. And God has also given to us today some incredible promises. We think of perhaps His greatest promise, that if we put our faith in Jesus Christ trusting in what he did for us on that cross, we will be forgiven of all of our sin. And some people will hear that message and they will have the laughter of doubt. But really, we should have the laughter of amazement that God, in his mercy and grace, has done this for undeserving sinners. And so in the story, we have both the laughter of doubt and the laughter of amazement. Now, like we did with chapter 14 of Genesis, we're going to skip over chapter 16. As I said before, I do believe, as 2 Timothy 3.16 says, that all Scripture is breathed out by God. It's all profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. But I don't believe that all Scripture is equally profitable. So that's why we're skipping it over. Not that there's nothing to learn from chapter 16. And I will... We skip over it, but I will give you a very brief summary of what happens in chapter 16. It's a chapter about Hagar and the birth of Ishmael. What happens is, as we know, God has promised to Abraham that he would have many descendants. He would make of him a great nation, but still in his 80s, he has no son. And so Sarah, Sarai, as she's known at this point in the story, she has a plan. She decides to give her slave, Hagar, to Abraham to be his wife. And she conceives, and Sarah regrets this plan, probably out of jealousy. But, but Hagar does give birth to a son, and he is named Ishmael. So Abraham does finally, in his 80s, have a son. Now, I'm not skipping the chapter because it has a lot of uh, unflattering details about Abraham and Sarah. That's not the reason why I'm skipping over it. Uh, I will 
though, comment that the Bible telling us that Abraham had two wives at the same time doesn't mean that the Bible is saying that what Abraham did was good. It wasn't good. As I've said before, description does not equal prescription. The uh, the book of Genesis is not telling us do everything that Abraham did. You know, he did a lot of things that were sinful. It's not, it's not promoting slavery, for example, when we're told that Sarah has a slave named Hagar. It's telling us, though, what happened, really without hiding uh, some unflattering details in their lives. So it's not telling us... Abraham is your model. You need to do everything that he did, and everything he did was good and acceptable in the eyes of God. Abraham is called a man of faith in Scripture, but he wasn't a perfect man. We already saw that when we began this this series. Uh, All of the, uh, well, some of the things in his life that that we would say uh, he shouldn't have done. So he was not a perfect man. He was a a flawed man in many ways. But as we've been going through the story of Abraham, what I've been trying to emphasize is that really Abraham is not the hero of this story. Uh, We sometimes think of Abraham as one of the great heroes of the faith. But when you look at his story, a lot of the times he's not acting very heroically. Uh, He is a sinful man. And so the hero is not Abraham, it really is God. God is the hero of the story. Without God, Abraham would be nothing. There really was not anything special about Abraham. We're not told any uh, detail about Abraham that would make him uh, the most likely candidate for God uh, to work out these promises for him. God simply chose him in his grace. And so Abraham, in many ways, is not a model for us. He is a model for us, though, in that he believed the promises of God. And really, I haven't mentioned this yet, but really we should see when we get to, or when we did arrive at chapter 12 of Genesis, there really is a turning point in Scripture, Really a turning point in God's plan to fix this broken world. Because in chapter 12, he picks one individual and really one family, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, their descendants. He chooses this one family who become this one nation through whom will come Abraham's ultimate offspring, Jesus, who was born a Jew who would bring salvation to this world and would fulfill that promise given to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, where God tells him, in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so really to understand scripture, you need to see Genesis chapter 12 as really a a, a pivotal point, a turning point in God's plan and really in in scripture, that God is, is beginning to do something new and he will work out his plan of salvation through the nation of Israel. Though they were a flawed people, an imperfect people, uh, that's the way God chose to do it. So that's what happens in chapter 16. Ishmael is born. Now between the end of, of chapter 16 and the beginning of chapter 17, 13 years pass. So Abram is now 99 years old. In order for God's promises to be fulfilled about his descendants, obviously he needs a son. And Abram thinks that Ishmael, now 13 years old, is that son. But God has other plans. God says to Abram in verse 1 of chapter 17, I am God Almighty. In Hebrew, God Almighty is El Shaddai. It's a name for God that emphasizes his, his power, his sufficiency. He's able 
sufficient to fulfill all of His promises, even when it seems impossible. God tells Abram, verse 4, you shall be the, the father of a multitude of nations. God changes Abram's name to Abraham. Abram means exalted father. Abraham means father of a multitude. So think about how it must have been for, for, for Abram all those years. Into his 80s. Without a son but having a name that means exalted father. How many children do you have? Exalted father. Zero. Name didn't seem to fit. And then he finally gets one son, Ishmael, and God changes his name to a name that means father of a multitude. And I think we're supposed to see some humor in this. An exalted father with no children. Then a father of a multitude at 99 years old with just one son. Again, the promise of God seems impossible. Now, at first, God said that he would make of Abram a great nation, chapter 12, verse 2. Now he says he will make Abram into nations, plural, and kings will come from him. So all of these, all of these promises to, to Abram, or to Abraham, as he's not now called, all of these promises really would be, would be crazy talk, would just be utter foolishness, except for the fact that Abraham's God is God Almighty, El Shaddai, the God who is able to do what he promises. When we get down to verse 9, verse 10, God introduces something new. God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant uh, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. So God tells Abraham, circumcision, verse 11, shall be the sign, a sign of the covenant between you and between me and you. Circumcision was supposed to remind Abraham's descendants of their identity as recipients of God's promises through Abraham. And then at the end of the chapter, verses 22 to 27, we're told that Abraham obeyed God. Every male in his household was circumcised, including himself. Now, we today might think this is quite strange, uh, this, this uh, need for all of the male uh, descendants and all of the people in his household and Abraham himself to be circumcised. Um, and uh, we might wonder, well, how does this fit in for today? Uh, what we need to understand is that the Bible, God's word was not given all at once. And many times people point out things in the Old Testament and say, well, why don't you do this anymore? The Bible says that you're to do this. Uh, All sorts of rules are in the Old Testament that uh, later on Jesus reveals are not necessary for us to keep any longer. So this was part of the covenant between God and Abraham. Uh, Circumcision was a sign, a visible sign of that covenant. Now, we today are living in the days of the new covenant. You might remember when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, uh, when he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And so what he was saying is that his death on the cross would bring about something new, a new uh, agreement between God and humankind, that through his death, all of our sin would be taken care of completely. So under this new covenant, the sign of the covenant is no longer circumcision. But we do have two signs of the new covenant. What are they? They are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism is most similar to circumcision in that when you begin 
as a member of this new covenant community. Typically, you are baptized. At least that's the way Scripture says it should be. So baptism and the Lord's Supper, they identify us as recipients of God's promises through Jesus Christ. Now we need to be careful though, because what the nation of Israel did was they trusted in just being a physical descendant of Abraham, being circumcised, being members of this nation. And they thought, well, I'm okay because I'm all right with God because um, I'm just a member of this nation, the people of God. And sometimes we can, uh, or people can, trust in maybe being baptized or, or taking the Lord's Supper and thinking uh, that the, the ritual itself is what saves. But there has to be faith behind it. It has to be real. And Scripture often talks about the prophets later on, talk about the circumcision of the heart, uh, talking about something inward, not just something outward that needs to be a part of our lives for the nation of Israel, but also for us today. Uh, we might have these signs of the covenant, baptism, the Lord's Supper, but is there faith behind that? Is there love for God behind it? Those are also, uh, you could say, additional signs of the covenant. Uh, if we have love for God and love for others, uh, those are necessary uh, components to what it means to be the people of God today under the new covenant. So this is very significant, and it was a big deal uh, when Christianity came on the scene, when, when the church grew to the Gentile nations, and would the Gentiles need to be circumcised as well? What well, was decided? No, uh, that would not be necessary. Uh, we have baptism, though, and the Lord's Supper. But that's where it comes from for Israel. Genesis chapter 17. Now going down to verse 15, it seems that by this time that, that Abraham has given up hope that his wife Sarah will have a child. It seems that at this point, all of his hopes are in Ishmael, that Ishmael will be the one that God will use to fulfill his promise to Abram about descendants. So what God tells him next must have come as a big shock. You know, we who've read the story, we know all that happens, and we forget that Abraham knew very little as he went along. And that's really what it means to live by faith. We don't have all of uh, the answers. We don't have the full explanation. We don't see uh, everything that's going to happen. And so God doesn't tell him everything at once. He keeps adding uh, more and more details as he goes along. And so at the beginning, uh, Abraham knew very little. And it seems at this point, he'd given up hope that Sarah would have a son. Look at verses 15 and 16. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. And so Sarah will have a son. And what was, what was Abraham's response? He laughs. God's promise is too incredible to believe. He says to himself in verse 17, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Chapter 18, Sarah also laughs at this promise in verse 12. And Sarah and Abraham's laughter is a laughter of doubt. What God is promising is too incredible to believe. And God tells Abraham that the child born to Sarah will be named Isaac. 
It's a fitting name. Do you know what the name Isaac means? It means he laughs. And that's what Abraham did when he was told that Isaac would be born. He laughed. And then when we get over to chapter 21, Isaac is born. And Sarah says in verse 6, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And so the promise of Isaac, it brought a laughter of doubt. But in chapter 21, the birth of Isaac brings a laughter of amazement. That God really did this thing that was too impossible to believe. Uh, this week I was, uh, I was reading Romans 4 as part of my regular daily Bible reading. And verses 20 and 21 caught my attention. Uh, the verses say, No unbelief made Abraham waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. So the question is, well, is, is, is Paul here sort of sugarcoating the truth? Is he making Abraham look better than he actually was? Because uh, it does seem from Genesis 17 that, that Abraham did doubt the promise of the birth of Isaac. Now, some Jewish and Christian commentators have tried to get around this by saying that Abraham his laugh was a joyful laugh, a happy laugh. But I don't think we can really say that. It, it seems clear that Abraham's laugh at, uh, in the 17th chapter of Genesis was a laughter of, of doubt. So how do we answer this, this uh, apparent difficulty between the two texts? Well, I think what Paul is saying here is that overall, Abraham maintained, maintained a firm conviction, belief in God's promise, and we see that he acted on that faith. And so like all of us, he had momentary doubts. In chapter 17, he had one of those momentary doubts. But later he came to believe that God could do what he said. Our, our faith is not, is not perfect. None of us have, have a perfect faith that, that doesn't uh, fluctuate or waver at some time. Sometimes we do have doubts. Sometimes we wonder, well, can, can God really do what he says he will do? Sometimes we might even think, is there? Is there a God? Am I really, am I really right in believing in the God of the Bible? And sometimes we might have these questions and these doubts. Our faith is not always perfect. But at the end of our lives, hopefully we'll be able to say, I always maintained my faith in God. Doesn't mean that we didn't waver and have to doubt at some point, but overall, overall we could say that we maintained that faith in the promises of God. And I think that's what Paul is saying here. He didn't have per Abraham didn't have perfect faith. He wasn't a perfect man. But overall, it could, be said, it could be said that he was fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. So when thinking about the laughter of doubt, the laughter of amazement, the story of Abraham and Sarah and the birth of Isaac, we could also think of the promises that God has given to us today. And as I thought about this story I thought about 2 Peter chapter 3, where the Apostle Peter writes that, that scoffers will laugh at the promise of the second coming of Christ. It's something we believe as Christians. We believe that God will do. This is a promise we have from God. Now, is the promise of Christ's second coming any less incredible than the promise that Sarah, a 90-year-old woman, would have a son. I don't think it's any less incredible. If anything, I would say that the promise of the second coming is more incredible. That we're believing in something 
First of all, a promise from a God we've never seen. We're trusting in this book, the Bible, that these are the promises from a real God, God Almighty, who is able to do what he's promised. We're believing that one day, Jesus, who died and rose again, we believe, who ascended into heaven, that one day, we don't know when, but one day, he will return. And you can understand, I think, why some people scoff at our belief in that promise and think that it's just uh, ridiculous, too impossible to believe. Now, I believe that the promise would be laughable if not for the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. I think everything should go back uh, when we think about why we believe what we believe today. It all goes back to the resurrection. You know, what's the explanation for all that happened? We know that Christ is a fact. Jesus of Nazareth died on a cross. Uh, His tomb was empty. His followers believed that he had risen from the dead. Even those who were against him, his enemies, some of them believed. And we can think of how the Lord has worked in our own lives since then, and, and, and we put this all together and look at Scripture and, and look about uh, how the, the Lord has opened our eyes to it, and, and we believe today that, that, that God is real, that Christ came, that He died, that He rose again, and if He did that, well, then He's able also to come again. But it's no less of an incredible promise than the promise given to Abraham and Sarah. So today, we can laugh at these promises, like the second coming. We can laugh with the the laughter of doubt. I think that's the normal reaction. Or we can look at it and believe and laugh with the laughter of amazement. If we believe this, then we, tr- we should be amazed, amazed at God's grace and mercy, amazed at, at what He has done for us, how Christ died for us. God has brought great blessing to the world through Jesus Christ, amazed that, that God was willing to do this uh, for us, and amazed at all of the promises that are even yet to be fulfilled. And sometimes we can struggle with doubt, but may we, in the end, come back to what we believe and not laugh with a laughter of doubt, but a laughter of amazement at the incredible promises of God to us. If we truly believe these things, then it should affect the way that we live. It should affect uh, our outlook on life. It should affect uh, how we treat one another, thinking about how God has treated us. And uh, even in disappointments and heartache, uh, we can look to the incredible promises of God and gain hope and strength and comfort in them.